Hello, this is Dr. Patty, and we're at capacity, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. So today I wanted to tell you a little bit about my experience with um, identifying and combating inflammation, and I'll be doing this through a case presentation um, with some basic things that I've learned. And I think that the main thing uh, here is that uh, we can have programs that are highly complicated, uh, but what we find is that the more basic the program is, the more likely it is that the patient will succeed uh, in the program. Now, how do I turn these slides? Aha, uh -huh. okay. So even Time Magazine, of course, uh, agrees that uh, the secret killer is inflammation, and we know that inflammatory processes are responsible for uh, cardiac events and colon cancers and Alzheimer's. Um, and, and basically, any other disease of the body is going to be uh, identified that way. In our practices, uh, the most important identification is going to be clinical. And uh, when I see a patient who's overweight or I see anybody with any kind of um, skin lesions or uh, complaining of arthritis, um, those are the things that we know are showing us that there is some kind of inflammation in the body. And this is, this is really just a joke when I say combating inflammation, do not eat. Uh, but it, it, it is true that inflammation has to do not only uh, with what we eat in a big way, but uh, also how much we eat. It turns out that uh, the amount of calories we eat directly uh, corresponds to the amount of inflammation in the body. Um, so some of the diseases that we're seeing that clearly tell us there's some source of inflammation. And I can tell you that any time I see any of these conditions, I'm going to start looking at the gut first. So whether a patient starts with telling me that they have an allergic reaction, which usually is coming from uh, intestinal uh, imbalances in the bowel flora and destabilizing mast cells so you have more of an allergic reaction, or whether it's arthritis and affecting particular joints, we know that once you're in an inflammatory state, what happens is that the joint, the organ, the system that is the weakest is going to demonstrate whatever the disease is. It could be a genetic weakness towards a certain cancer. It could be a cardiac weakness. It could be the joints. It could be the valves. It could be the blood vessels. But I think it's important to realize that inflammation can cause any of these, and the place that it usually presents is the place that is most likely uh, to be the weakest. Um, anytime you see eczema and psoriasis in a patient, I've highlighted some of the ones that are very, very clear. Anytime you see any kind of skin manifestation, you know that there's some kind of inflammatory process going on, and generally that inflammatory process is going on in the intestinal system. Um, so, uh, and, and of course, if you have a, a case with uh, anybody with ulcerative colitis or irritable bowel, anybody who tells you I've got reflux, you know that they have some kind of generalized inflammation, partly related to the fact that they're not absorbing nutrients, and partly related to the fact that mucosal uh, inflammatory process is a very large creator of cytokines, uh, which can uh, affect any part in the body. The most common presentation that we're having, actually, of generalized inflammation, anybody we're seeing with any of those things, we're looking for adrenal insufficiency, because nowadays this just seems to be um, more common. And as we know, that if there are stressors uh, that are affecting the body, that the first demand goes to cortisol. And as the body's adrenal system starts to try to manufacture enough cortisol, it will steal from DHEA and progesterone. And uh, at the same time, because the sympathetic nervous system is firing, you start to utilize more nutrients. The nutrients that you use most commonly under these scenarios is B vitamins, magnesium, and vitamin C. So uh, I think that it's really important to recognize that uh, even a patient with a, a progesterone deficiency may, and especially if it's coming earlier than what you expect, like a teenager or a person in their 20s, you have to look at why. And generally this is because of some kind of stressor that's, that's creating a lack of enough progesterone. But what you see in these patients with these low hormones is all kinds of inflammatory processes because as you may know, 
these major hormones that I've listed on this page are the major hormones that are responsible for keeping inflammation throughout the body controlled. And as soon as they start to go down, we start to see all of the diseases that we just talked about a second ago. And uh, as the inflammation continues, the chance of having a more serious condition is actually more likely. Um, there's many markers that we can have for inflammation. One of them, and I've, I've, I've highlighted one that I use more frequently, is the HSCRP. And we're looking for that number to be less than one. Um, but I, I can tell you, the, the first marker of inflammation, as I pointed out before, is the clinical presentation. If you get any of the clinical presentations that I've just uh, listed a second ago, you know you have inflammation. But there's certain markers you can follow. Um, you can follow the HSCRP. You can follow the IL-6. And I'll show you what, why the IL-6 is not a very good re one to follow. It's not a very stable one. Um, and therefore, and you can see the ranges are different from the different labs, but IL-6 does correlate well with um, sudden cardiac death and, and uh, death in general uh, within three years. Uh, but the only thing is that the, the lab test is not as accurate. Uh, similarly, TNF-alpha is not the most accurate test. But uh, luckily, even a white blood cell count above 7 correlates with inflammation. So does a triglyceride level greater than 100 and a hemoglobin A1C greater than 5.4. So these are the numbers that we're looking for. But anything above this, you know that you have a lot of glycation going on in the body. And when you have glycation because of simple sugars or refined products, there's very good studies to show that that is the source of a great deal of inflammation. I'll also be showing you the antioxidant function. This is one of my favorite markers to follow for inflammation. So besides the clinical presentation, the HSCRP and the antioxidant function are two that I use in a great way. And they appeal to patients because they're familiar with these things. And I'll show you uh, a patient that we have, uh, the case that we have and how we use that. Um, this is actually a study from uh, the cardiac literature that just shows that uh, out of all of the analytes that you can test, um, there's very little stability of uh, acute phase reactants and fibrinogen and uh, adhesion molecules and cytokines. Um, and obviously, if they're frozen, they can be stable. But I find that the easiest ones to follow are HSCRP and WPC count. So those are the ones that I follow besides the clinical presentation. And I included this slide just so that you know that this is a full article available online that actually talks about all the markers of inflammation and how they are measured and if you want to get that kind of information. And just to, to look at how this correlates, and I, I have to say, that I don't think that you ever can depend on any one marker, uh, but what you do is you use the entire clinical picture along with several different markers to give you the entire picture. Um, so a C-reactive protein we know indicates an increased risk for destabilized plaque and uh, clotting, and people with levels above 3.0 in a New England Journal of Medicine article were almost three times as likely to die from a heart attack. And I think that was within four to five years that that study was done. Um, and this is another study showing that C-reactive protein and IL-6 uh, predict over a 4.6-year uh, period when they were both high, a 2.6 time more likely uh, to die from some kind of inflammatory disease. So when we talk about how we actually address um, inflammation. I think that's where the heart of what I want to cover today would be. And um, many of you may know that the model that I use is based upon uh, correcting all of these five areas. And you'll, you're going to see that without correcting even one of these areas, you're not going to get the whole picture on the inflammation. And to give you a very simple idea, um, even mind stress that is going to put weight and burden on your hormonal profiles, especially your cortisol, your DHEA, your progesterone, and decline all of those hormones so that you have more inflammation in the body from that hormonal uh, imbalance. Mind stresses similarly will increase your nutritional utilization 
And if the nutritional utilization is too high, you won't have enough antioxidants to combat any kind of free radical damage that normally would occur in the body. Similarly, something simple like body pain. If I have a patient coming in and telling me that they're in pain, not only do I know that they have an inflammatory process, mostly starting from the gut generally, but I also know that in turn, that pain is putting a stress on the system which would increase, increase the inflammation even more. So you really have to address each and every area to get a complete um, picture and a complete solution. So I want to give you an example of a, of a man who came in a few years ago, a 42-year-old male with ulcerative colitis. And um, this gentleman, if I'm not mistaken, was on 6 mercaptopurine at the time that we uh, started treating him. And he was having exacerbations every four to five months. And this is a very, very typical scenario. You have a person with a gut imbalance, some kind of intestinal something, whether it's IBS or reflux or ulcerative colitis. Um, and this scenario has gone on for eight years. And slowly as the nutrient uh, deficiencies start to kick in, you see the severe fatigue. And that's what this gentleman had presented with is severe fatigue for four years with an energy level of one to two rated out of ten. And then comes the last piece, which is when that inflammation gets bad enough, you start to have severe pain all over. If you look at these patients with um, long-standing inflammatory conditions of the intestines, you always find that they eventually also develop the arthritic complications that come with this. Um, so this is a very typical scenario. We see this very, very frequently, so this is a nice case. And then also the sleep of 2 out of 10. And many of you may know that there are studies uh, showing that sleep deprivation actually in itself uh, will increase all the cytokine markers by 40, uh, anywhere from 20 to 40 percent, depending upon which study and which group of people you look at. Uh, but so when we see people with sleep uh, deprivation, we know that that in itself, correcting that is going to help because it's only in sleep that you can, uh, can correct the adrenal stress, which ultimately fixes the adrenal level hormones and decreases inflammation through that way. So each area is just as important as the other, and I put a lot of importance um, on sleep. And um, he came in with his lab values, and, and again, we're going to be looking at his, uh, his situation from the point of view of hormones, nutrients, toxicities, mind, body, the whole thing. So hormone-wise, the testosterone level was 176. This is the total testosterone. The bioavailable was 76. And in the parentheses, you see where the upper quartile, where I would like to see these optimally. The DHEAS was 38. Um, and that one should optimally be somewhere in the upper 100s to 200 range. Um, the free T3, which is basically the only most important marker that I follow for thyroid, uh, should be looked at to be above 450. If you look at the American Endocrine Society, they use 680 as their upper limit, but we know T3 is the only active fraction in the body. The AM cortisol was 7, and even though this is within the normal range on um, the serum labs, and these are all serum labs, um, this would be considered a person, anytime you see a number under 9, you know that this person is not sleeping well, they're not recovering their adrenals, and they're not producing any hormones, partly because of the adrenal burden. And of course, we know that because all the hormones are low. Um, the C-reactive protein, which we want under 1.0, is at 9.3. And you may know that, you know, if that C-reactive protein, and this is a high, high sensitivity one, goes above 10, you may know that there are some recommendations that you go uh, searching for all kinds of cancers and diseases throughout the body because it's a, it's a marker that is, uh, that's one of the indicative markers. And I can tell you that we've had patients on whom this was the sole marker along with the elevated WBC who have been diagnosed with cancers just by following these two markers and wondering what was happening. Um, Hemoglobin A1C was 5.6. We're looking for that to be under the 5.3 to 5.2 range. Um, when we did nutrient testing and we used an antioxidant function profile from SpectraCell, we found uh, that that SpectraCell was in the 38th percentile um, or so, somewhere under the 50th percentile, which means you still have 50% of your free radicals available to do damage. And we're always looking for upper quartile on this. And this is a very, very typical uh, pattern for somebody 
who's B vitamin deficient because you can see all of the green squares show that they're just barely above the blue line, which the blue line represents 25th percentile, uh, with the B6 actually having fallen below it. Um, but the important thing here is that you're always looking for the 75th percentile. Um, the magnesium was in the 38th percentile. The glutathione was in the 25th percentile. I'm not showing you that slide um, here. But there's, there obviously was quite a bit of inflammation. So our goal is going to be to bring this antioxidant function up. Um, we did do a Genova CDSA panel. And, and just basically, this is, this is more academic than anything else. It showed us an eosinophil X of 13, which is double of where we would want it, and that's very indicative of high-level inflammation as our putrative short-chain fatty acids. So just some markers that you could measure, but I wouldn't suggest that we measure them on everybody. We could have guessed it when we saw a CRP of 9.3. So in this gentleman's um, case, we discussed how the symptoms are caused by imbalances in each of the five areas and started with some therapy. The goal of the first eight weeks in our program is just to get them feeling better before we start to make the program complicated with take away this, do this dietary change. The first goal is to get them feeling better as quickly as possible. Um, so we supported the adrenal glands with DHEA 25 milligrams at AM and noon orally, testosterone PLO 50 milligrams every day, and we offer all three forms of testosterone, but we used this one because that's what he preferred melatonin at 3 milligrams at night to help him get into REM4 sleep, cortisol 5 milligrams in the AM and noon, and, and actually the instruction that we give these people is to start tapering themselves upwards with a AM, noon, and 3 p.m. dose until they feel okay. If you read Jeffrey Williams' safe uses of cortisol, you'll find that up to 20 to even 30 milligrams are not really going to be suppressing the adrenal uh, activity in any big way. But we're rather liberal, especially with these patients, and allowing them to go up for a few months if they need to. And uh, we held on the thyroid in this case, even though it was low, um, and suggested that we uh, start it later, only because we recognized that without supporting the adrenal glands, we may have a, a cardiac uh, reaction. The nutritional program that we used was mostly food-based. Um, we use a lot of super fat foods that are dense because, as you may know, it takes 35 peaches and 4 apples in order to make the one, uh, one wake up for one peach and one apple about 10 years ago, um, and plant-based because of the uh, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory value, but we didn't start that until later. And then basic supplements, a multi and omega I'll tell you about, and the measurement of the nutritional stand. This is the crux. You always want to measure because with measurement are three things that you learn. One thing that you learn with measurement is what is the adequacy of the food and supplement program. The second thing you learn is what is the absorption of it. And the third thing is whether the utilization is being matched. And for example, under high stress, people utilize more magnesium and vitamin C and Bs. And if for a high level athlete, they use more CoQ10 and carnitine. So it is dependent upon utilization. Um, in terms of this gentleman's nutritional program, the food part we started very easy. We started with uh, just discontinuing dairy, since dairy is such a high inf anti, uh, inflammatory potential because of the casein. And we uh, started mangosteen juice, four ounces twice a day, and I'll show you the company we used for that. But the mangosteen has an independent COX-2-8 inhibitor activity, and it's one of the strong antioxidants. We use a lot of juices, but we try to pick and choose to keep the supplement regimen down. Uh, we started on Essentials 5-in-1, which I'll show you why we picked that, and Rx Omega. And then B12 injections every week for, uh, actually, probably in his case, we used it for almost 12 weeks, um, and uh, methylated form. And magnesium glycinate, 480 milligrams at night, which we got from Premier Research Lab, and N -acetyl, uh, uh cysteine which was uh, 1,200 milligrams per day. And you can see that we're aiming for a plant-based diet in the future. And this is all to just reduce that inflammation. This is a, basically a very strong anti-inflammatory uh, program along with the hormones that we put on board. And you can see, you can pick so many things for an anti-inflammatory program, and I'll have people ask me, well, is resveratrol better? Is this better? Is that better? At the end of the day, you're looking to correct certain markers, and so the way you choose is what it is that suits the patient and the patient's able to do. Um, 
it turns out that Essentials 5-in-1 does have all the hormone activators in it, like the selenium, which is at 400, and the chromium, which is at uh, 500, and um, a, a good level of iodine of 1,000 micrograms and a methylated B12. And if you look at some of the other ones that I have up here, the, the doses are not going to uh, be uh, close to uh, what we're looking for in four caps and also the cost. Um, but I think the most important thing is you want something that's basic that can be used without having too many bottles. And as far as omega, um, based upon data that was published in New England Journal about the enteric coated preparations uh, being almost two to three fold absorbed in a better way, I find uh, the ability to keep the dose down and still achieve a correction. And when I say correction, I mean that we actually are measuring the HS omega levels and, and seeing that, you know, there's some kind of correction in most of these. So um, you're, you really look to measure the HS omega, the omega levels, because otherwise it's, it's difficult. And there's a lot of debate about whether you want a triglyceride form or an ethyl ester form, but there's two factors that sort of drive what... Um, uh, what what the way I'm choosing one is enteric coating because it, it increases the absorption a couple of folds so it allows you to keep the pill count down and the second again is just measurement um, I always get this question about krill oil versus fish oil so I put this slide in here just to uh, address that um, they've they the, the main thing is that the omega-3 content of krill oil is only 7 to 24 percent and fish oil is uh, greater than 30 percent and then the RX Omega is greater than 75 percent. Uh, the fish oil has greater stability um, and it turns out that krill oil is not necessarily more sustainable and uh, has greater absorption and actually the FDA has required those claims to be removed. I also often get the question from vegetarians as to whether or not it's okay for them to utilize um, flax and hemp and all those kind of sources to get the omega-3 up. And what I found when we measure is that, and, and this was what we would be expected, in order to make, uh, you know, uh, for example, flax seed has short-chain fatty acids, alpha-linoleic acid, in order to make 46 milligrams of EPA or DHA long-chain fatty acid, you would have to take in 1,000 milligrams of uh, the short chain fatty acid, which means you'd be really having to take in a lot of flax just to make enough for a long chain fatty acid, is, which is what you need for the protection. So um, I think it becomes hard uh, when people are vegetarian to meet this need, but still there are good sources in hemp and algae, and as you know, ultimately all of, the, all of it comes from algae. And that's also why, interestingly, um, farmed salmon has almost a three to six fold uh, lower omega-3 content compared to its omega-6 content. So that's also, you know, for people who are asking you, well, it, can I get it from salmon? Yes, you can, but it, any fish you get it from has to be wild uh, instead of farmed because with the farmed ones, you're going to get more pesticides, more color residue, uh, and also an inferior content of omega-3. Just a little tidbit. Um, but as far as uh, the selection, mostly because it's enteric coated, uh, I'm, I'm using that one. And also, if you look at the cost, the cost of this particular one um, is, uh, is really uh, actually the, the cheapest when you look at uh, the capsules. And um, that, the number of capsules there is actually uh, two for the MD, uh, the RX Omega, which is what you want to use. Um, and this is the test that I look at, the HS Omega um, index, the EPA DHA ratio. We know that um, if it's above 8%, it gives you a very lower risk of any kind of cardiac event. And the nice thing here, I have so many people come in and say, well, I'm taking Omega 369s. Is that okay? Generally, the answer should be no, because Omega-6 is always in overabundance, and I can tell you when, even when you look at this one here, you can see that the omega-6, and especially the arachidonic acid, is way up too high. And um, this is very commonly what we see. So this is the kind of person you're going to say, take omega-3 uh, only, because your 6 to, to 3 ratio is too high. 
Um, and of course, we use omega-3s and the data supports using it in all of these conditions. And I can tell you just with omega-3, and the nice thing with the enteric coated is even one pill is going to give you the equivalent of 2 to 2.5 grams of, uh, of RBC content for the omega. Um, and I, I, I found that just that alone can decrease anxiety, depression by somewhere between 20 to 50 percent, and that's actually in the literature, and it's absolutely a mainstay for the inflammation. Um, in this gentleman, we used our standard way of taking care of the mind, in, and, and the one in the red is the most important, to rearrange the schedule to include 30 to 60 minutes of protected time and uncommit weekends. We tell these people not to watch the news, not to know who's having a bad marriage, who's sick, um, and conscious breath to oxygenate. Uh, but really, and if they're doing any exercise, we ask them to exercise in the aerobic range in a heart rate that they can speak. So we ask them to go outside and walk, but not to uh, exercise in a high level range because what they're doing, if they do, is they're producing lactic acid and increasing all of their cytokines and inflammation. Um, at week six, and this is on this regimen, DHEA 50 milligrams, testosterone 50, Cortisol has come up to 20 now. Melatonin is at 6 instead of the 3 we started. We've started on Armour Thyroid and elevated it from 30 to 60. Um, four caps of Essentials, two of Omega, 600 milligrams of magnesium glycinate at night. Um, and you have to realize this came after a, a middle visit. I'm, I'm jumping to week 6. Um, and acetylcysteine at 1,200. B12 and folate injections twice a week and no dairy. So this is the, and mangosteen juice. So this is basically the regimen this gentleman is on. And uh, we don't know anything about the exacerbations yet because it's too soon. Uh, the fatigue, the energy level is now consistently at six, which is once you t a patient tells you my energy level is a little better, my pain level is a little better, the pain is now a four out of ten, and they're sleeping, you know that you've managed to get inflammation down to some extent. And of course, we didn't have any measurements at the six-week mark, but just the clinical picture of less pain is telling you that there's less cytokines and less inflammation going in the, on in the body. At this point, we increased the armor from 60 to 90. I used armor in this case because it was a, a T3, T4 combo, uh, which seems to work quite well. Um, we added pure greens, which was a superfood, which would increase our plant-based program, and at this point, added a plant-based diet. Um, so the basic diet that we added was based upon a flipped uh, pyramid with the vegetables at the bottom, 50% vegetables, 25% protein, 25% complex carbs at every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You can be assured that this is a rate ratio that I found to have the, the most uh, beneficial effect on glycemic um, control, insulin control, and any kind of inflammation at all. So this is a really nice plate to use. And for example, a breakfast would consist of maybe sautéed vegetables and a um, uh, some kind of a uh, uh, steel-cut oats and um, possibly a, an egg. So if, if you were eating on this mode without the, without the, um, the uh, plant-based diet, that would be something like what it would look like. But we ask people to do this for even their snacks. Um, the, hmm, somehow, why not? Okay. Um, and, and you may know that the China study does show the effect of animal protein on cancers and heart attacks and everything. Uh, just to give you an idea, something like milk protein, which is 87% casein, um, increases cancer uh, foci proliferation in rats. And you can uh, see 20% casein gives a very high proliferation versus 5% casein. Um, and this is just a simple example of a, of a kid with eczema. You guys may have heard this before, but you know it was one of the stark examples. Just after stopping the dairy for three weeks, uh, this young boy ended up going from eczema and two years of weeping lesions with bandages to basically 50% better with bandages off. And as we put the plant-based program into full effect, uh, by, by three months, he was completely uh, better. And um, 
we know that plant-based diets have been associated with basically decrease in all of the inflammatory conditions uh, that exist and the nutrient composition of plant and animal based foods is actually quite surprising. You'll find that from 500 calories uh, from equal parts of tomatoes, spinach, lima beans, peas, and potatoes, you get 33 grams of protein and equal 500 calories from beef, chicken, pork, and whole milk, milk you get 34 grams of protein. So really um, there's more uh, fiber of course in the plant based which is on the left and more beta carotene. You also can see that there, interestingly, is much more iron in the plant base, much more magnesium, much more calcium. It's a, it's a more um, nutrient-supportive uh, food. And we've, we've used uh, plant-based programs for people with uh, very, very successfully in fibromyalgia, psoriasis, eczema, arthritis, any of the uh, uh, bowel states, any inflammatory state with a high CRP, a low antioxidant profile, high blood pressure, any of these things. Um, the high, hardest one I can tell you is high blood pressure because by the time they've been diagnosed with high blood pressure, they've already had the disease for 15 to 20 years. That's what the cardiac literature is showing. And actually most of our literature is showing that anytime we get a disease diagnosis, you can be rest assured that it was in the making for 15 to 20 years. The way that we did the plant-based diet, um, is uh, usually we do it for two to three months. In, in this person's case, we strictly stuck to it for three months, um, adding a lot of green superfoods and uh, various type of uh, supplements that we like to use. Um, they're supposed to eat vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds. That's the crux of the program. And avoid all meat, fish, dairy, and eggs, which are known to increase the cytokines in the body. And minimize canned, boxed, processed, refined, fried, charred, and overcooked. And it's very well shown at this point. The, the diabetic literature and the um, endocrine literature does show that overcooked uh, food is going to give you more glycation and more um, uh, damage in the body. Um, and so, of course, when I said that we use some supplements, it depends upon what the patient needs. And I'll show you what we ended up using in, in this patient's ca case. The cleansing uh, vegetables, we usually give them a list and help them with learning how to make smoothies and things like that um, and ask them to stick to this with many different colors of vegetables. And we really work quite a bit with them to figure out how they can add the superfoods. And when I give you a list of superfoods, the thing to realize is that not every patient is going, to is going to think that any of these are necessarily palatable. And that's why many of them we have encapsulated into something called pure greens, or rather it is encapsulated in pure greens, and that's the one that I tend to use. But, but uh, we do try to put a heavy emphasis on trying to utilize um, these superfoods from raw organic sources and in food forms if possible. Um, so we work with a blender and try to teach them how to pick these superfoods and which ones suit them. If they can even get four or five of them in, in a day, we're happy. And I think the top ones generally are the raw cacao, the hemp seed, the aloe, um, the blue-green algae, the maca, which helps rebuild the uh, adrenal gland, the coconut, which is an amazing superfood. Uh, we recommend that they use coconut milk and coconut water, and uh, we actually recommend they use coconut water as a, as a staple to drink it. Um, and then, of course, many of the sea belch, you'll, you'll recognize a lot of things on here, and you'll always hear people, oh, they've shown resveratrol as well as resveratrol has been studied more. I, I would say that probably you're going to find that anything with high um, antioxidant value is going to be of use. This is one of the companies, actually there's two companies on here. Um, Genesis is one of the companies that we get our juices from because there's no additives, no preservatives, and they're wild harvested on 100-year protected land, which makes it uh, basically better than uh, organic certified. And uh, I get the mangosteen from there. And then uh, Sun Foods is what we're using for the raw and organic foods. And we keep some of these in the office and then tell patients to set up their own accounts um, so that they can get these. And I can tell you the mangosteen is really amazing in helping with um, the uh, the joints. Um, the Pure Greens formula, the six capsule is what they've written down here. And you'll notice that even in six capsules, you're getting the full 
um, 200 milligrams of resveratrol, which is a cardiac dose, and the full um, organic and raw 250 milligrams of turmeric. Uh, remember that organic products have 30% to 40% more nutrient value uh, than otherwise, and that's been shown in actually in a randomized study. Um, so uh, this is a way to get the full green tea dose, which is um, uh, concentrated, and, and this is what's been studied uh, for cancer, actually, in the organic cacao bean dulse. This is a nice way to not have to taste these horrible things. But some of them taste okay, but many of them don't taste that great in these kind of proportions. In this gentleman, we used three capsules three times a day to give him nine capsules because we were trying to uh, reverse it. I really haven't seen a formula that has all of these kind of things and this kind of dose. And also this is raw and organic and spectrophotometrically tested, which means that you're not talking about something that is um, even remotely possibly contaminated because they, they do the spectrophotometric testing on every raw material, which is not what any of the other companies uh, listed here at least are doing. Um, and, the, and the price is also extremely reasonable. Um, at five months, uh, this gentleman is on DHEA, testosterone. The cortisol is out now. This is now a fast forward to five months. There's melatonin is still there at six. The armor is at 120. Uh, we've got our basics on board, the multi and the omega. We've still got magnesium on board. Magnesium is one of your biggest adrenal supporters, so that stayed on board. NAC. The only time I would discontinue these is if I got another spectra cell showing that these were uh, corrected. B12 and folate, this would, is going to be discontinued at this point. This gentleman has been plant-based for three months, um, nine of pure greens and mangosteen. And um, the entire five months hasn't had an exacerbation. The energy is co uh, corrected to nine. The pain is a zero. And this is on no cortisol, which means the adrenals have corrected most likely because the sleep has corrected to eight solid hours in addition to the nutrients. Um, as far as levels, the testosterone level is 640. I mentioned above 700, but um, if you have a clinical response uh, at 640, then that's perfectly fine. The bioavailable is 254. Again, I mentioned above 350 as optimal. So I don't, I'm not going to drive the numbers higher if uh, there's a clinical response. Similarly with the DHEA, it's 120. We might be looking for above 200. Uh, free T3 is 320. Clinical response is good. AM cortisol is corrected. CRP needs to come down a little bit better to be very, very much optimal, but it's very much lower than it was before. Um, and the WBC count um, is an 8. Uh, I, actually, I don't know what the new number was on that one. Uh, the hemoglobin A1C was 5.2, and the antioxidant function had come up but probably about 20 percentile points, still not as high as you want it. You can see it's still in the red. And um, all of the B vitamins um, had come up. You're really looking for them to be in the 70th percentile. They kind of look like they're mostly in the 60th percentile or 50th percentile, but they're way better than the 30th they were in. And if you look at the magnesium, it's also corrected, and so has the zinc. Um, so, uh, and, and the CDSA has also corrected. And I, I'm going to tell you this is completely academic. I would never get this test right now. Um, so if you look at what the anti-inflammatory program should look like, it should look like correcting the hormones that are anti-inflammatory, correcting the nutrients that are going to give you the most result with the least number of bottles. You can, you'll notice that this gentleman was not really on that many bottles when, it, when, you, when you looked at it at the end of the day. Um, uh, remove the toxicities just by increasing oxygenation, Increasing hydration, which part of the program is that they have to hydrate at at least uh, half their body weight in ounces with salt in it, and usually we use pink salt. Um, and increasing the pH, which was what was done with the plant-based diet, you were eliminating toxins. It's not some elaborate system of eliminating them. It's a very basic system, but it, it works pretty well. Uh, by reducing the mind stressors and reducing the body pain, put less uh, uh, stress on the system. And also by exercising, of course, in a more aerobic range. Um, so 
as I was pointing out, you the, the way that you are going to identify inflammation, the way we identify is by the clinical presentation. And the most common these days that we're seeing is this kind of adrenal insufficiency. This gentleman obviously had some adrenal insufficiency going on. And in his case, it was testosterone that was low. Um, but uh, what happens is as people get sick over time, no matter what the initial disease was, you uh, eventually will add adrenal insufficiency to the diagnosis. So clinical presentation with these kind of conditions are more important than the markers. The clinical presentation is the most important. And then, of course, we're looking for specific markers, um, especially, as I was mentioning, the HSCRP. And in this uh, gentleman, we did get the hemoglobin A1C down, and the antioxidant function wasn't in the 75th percentile, but it was better than where it started. Um, so I, I think that uh, for today, that's... Uh, how much we're going to cover, and I appreciate your attendance and your uh, attention today. And if there's any questions, that you can type them in, and um, and I can answer them. So I'm going to read the questions out uh, loud so that uh, you can see them. So, um, uh, what is my opinion on Juice Plus? Um, so the opinion on Juice Plus, I think that the concept is a good one, um, and uh, it is certainly a way for people to get in vegetables and get in uh, their uh, materials. Uh, but th there's two things I'm currently unaware of is whether it's raw and whether it's organic. I think organic is critical, especially when you look at the pesticide content that's coming out of so many things. Um, but I would say that the patients that I have tested on Juice Plus, and I have tested a lot of patients on Juice, Ju Juice Plus, um, are uh, generally uh, antioxidant deficient. And it's not just because of the Juice Plus, but clearly the Juice Plus hasn't been able to correct some of the things that I've seen. So you, it has a lot of things in it, but it doesn't have necessarily therapeutic things in it. And a lot of the Juice Plus uh, content is regular vegetables and fruits. Um, I would say that if you're going to take some kind of a capsule uh, for that purpose, take a superfood capsule. Take something like pure greens. Take something that has uh, dense nutrient foods in it rather than uh, green peppers and, and, and tomatoes and so on. But it's definitely the right idea. Um, will this webinar be available again to view after this original airing? Yes, it gets posted onto the, um, it gets posted onto the website website. Uh, of the um, of MD prescriptives. Are your bowel cleanse one and two meant to be taken together? They're always meant to be taken together. I use them with probiotic for the first one month or two. I don't keep people on this. I'm trying to train them taking one and two together with the probiotic with every single meal while I'm trying to train the bowels to uh, function properly. And if you look, there's actually a detox newsletter that talks about how to use these uh, without the problem. Plant-based diet, is it raw or cooked? We try to um, recommend that they use as much raw as possible, but really both raw and cooked. Um, and for breakfast, what is the protein source? It could be lentils, it could be um, hemp seed, it could be nuts and seeds. We do ask them to eat nuts and seeds in it. So th these are the kind of sources of protein that one eats um, in the morning in a plant-based program. And we do have a few um, raw organic sources of protein powders that we use, which I actually didn't show you. I probably should have, and I will in a future webinar. Um, what is my opinion on machines that alkalinize water? I think that if you're doing other things to alkalinize the body, being very uh, aggressive about the water is also important, uh, but I think that um, it isn't a, a lot of people, if you're, if you're eating a high acidic diet and alkaline water, that's not going to help. But I, I do think that paying a lot of attention to a uh, water source is critical. Uh, will you make your slides available? Yes, those will be available on the internet. Um, can you reduce the pure greens daily dose if the person eats some vegetables and fruits, but you just want to augment a little? Absolutely. And the way to decide how you do this is what is their antioxidant function? If their antioxidant function is good, you may not need any kind of supplementation. See, you really want people to get things from their food. 
when we use supplementation, we try to use supplementation extremely carefully because we're not really looking to have them take one million pills. Um, so absolutely. For patients that are allergic to fish, how do you recommend they take their omega? I have had patients tell me this, and I have not had anybody allergic to the omega-3, but I'm sure it can happen, uh, so I'm not going to, uh, to say that it can't happen. Can you check the pH of the urine to ensure alkalinization? Yes, and you're looking for a pH level of greater than 6.2, uh, 6.4 to 7.0 in the morning. Uh, next question, how do you titrate your thyroid dosing by symptoms or blood, and how often do you adjust or test? We titrate our thyroid dosing by symptoms only and retest every three months um, just to make sure they're within the safe range. If, whether they're below the range or above the range, if they're symptom-free, that means good energy, good mental clarity, good memory, focus, concentration, uh, metabolic uh, metabolism is good, we stop increasing the thyroid dose. But we pretty much will increase it reasonably aggressively every three to four weeks. Where do you get recipes for smoothies, etc., that we give to our rest, uh, patients? We utilize a lot of books. Um, we've used a lot of Jeff Premax books and so on. But I will tell you that what we're finding now is that we have a basic veggie smoothie, which we are modifying uh, ourselves uh, according to the patient and the patient's tongue and the patient's taste. You can't believe how many things you may recommend in the superfood category. So we actually have people, and this is what the basis of we have now a, a, a short nutritional preceptorship of two days where uh, doctors are sending in their, their, their nutrition person just to see how you work with the patient to get it doable. Because what you're trying to do is figure out which superfoods. And I'm not committed to which ones. If they have big gut issues, I definitely want them on aloe. And raw organic aloe is going to be the way to go. Um, what do you do for the patients with diverticulitis as far as nuts and seeds? You have to limit the nuts and seeds for people with diverticulitis. Um, they can grind them, uh, and, and you know that's one of the ways we can do it. Let's see, what's the next question? Are we still doing the physician training in Orlando in the office? Yes, we have a clinical preceptorship to learn the hormones, nutrients, detoxification, uh, mind and body uh, restoration. Uh, so we do have that. Um, everyone talks about water. What water are we supposed to be drinking? Alkaline, reverse osmosis. I think paying attention to water, reverse osmosis system is the one that I have in my house. Uh, but frankly, I've looked at um, the systems of the canyon water. And, uh, and the one thing about canyon water, and this is one of the things that we very much follow in our practice, which is we try to limit ourselves to things that are not multi-level marketed. And the fact is that that's the same thing with Juice Plus. That's the same thing with Kangen Water. They are multi-level marketed, and, and I think that's a problem. But uh, I think the mechanism that they have for the Kangen Water is actually the best, and I, apparently there's some way to do it without the multi-level marketed piece to it. So I think that the water is critical. I mean, a great majority of our body is water. And, and also to pay attention to the water we're bathing in, you absolutely should have... Um, water purifiers and chlorine removers on the shower heads and uh, not be swimming in chlorine water. It's an absolute, uh, one of the biggest inflammatories you could ever have in your body is chlorine and hypochlorite that forms from that. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, somebody's asking again, where is it that we will be able to hear this or see the slides on MD Prescriptive's website? Um, another question, patients allergic to iodine, do you give still for low thyroid? Now, remember that allergy to iodine is not a real entity because all of our plants and all of our uh, sources that we eat have some iodine in them. And this is a mineral micronutrient, which is an essential micronutrient. Um, so generally, when we're talking about allergy to iodine, they've somehow had it in a contrast or they've had it in, in some kind of source um, which uh, they uh, were allergic to, and I can tell you it's not the micronutrient iodine. So uh, we will often give them a very, very low dose, and what I'll tell them to do is maybe take an iodoral capsule and crush it and take a little bit pow a powder on, and put it on their tongue or test it through a Lugol solution or uh, something like that. But 
you can be rest assured that if they're taking pure greens, they're getting iodine. And if they're taking essentials, they're getting iodine. Uh, so yes, we do st give it for low thyroid. And of course, as you may know, we're also asking people to continue on good level, good doses of iodine of at least uh, two to six milligrams for um, protection from electromagnetic radiation and so on. Um, the name of the person I mentioned for smoothies is Jeff Premack. Uh, but you can also look at David Wolf. He's got a lot of stuff on there. And uh, we also have actually a recipe book coming out at the end of the year, which will share what we've learned over our experiments. Um, to clarify how many omegas uh, you would give to a patient, um, an equivalent dose of 2 grams daily to lower triglycerides. Now, I have found to lower triglycerides, the omegas are highly effective. It is really better if you can have them take... Uh, two of the RX Omega per day. It's the equivalent of three to four grams. And if you look at most of the studies with triglycerides, they've used anywhere in the two to four gram range. But I have to say, I've had much more, um, uh, I've had much more uh, effectiveness with um, with uh, the two ta two capsules than with just one. Uh, but even one will work. Um, iodine allergy, do you give it with a Benadryl for patient reassurance? No, I, I just do it, you know, that the other, you know, I just basically tell them that pretty much it's an essential micronutrient and let's support it slowly, just be extremely slow. Um, next question, when replacing progesterone, what level are you aiming at or premenopausally and postmenopausally in the serum? You're aiming for a clinical response primarily where they're sleeping perfect, they have no anxiety, they have no panic attacks, no irritability, no PMS symptoms, ha no heavy bleeding, breast cysts, ovarian cysts, fibroids, things like that. But um, you want a serum level between 5 and 15 on day 21 for a cycling person um, and even for a non-cycling person at any point. But I've had patients with a level of 3 who are perfectly fine and a patient who needs a level of 20. So that's why the clinical response is more important because remember, when you're measuring levels, no matter how you measure it, you're not going to be able to um, control for receptor site function. And you know receptor site function is um, what determines how well a hormone works. So if you have very active receptors, you may be able to get away with a much lower level. Um, next question, can people order MD prescriptions be bought by anyone or only through a practitioner? It's a clinician line only. The, le the, the doses are, are, it's a therapeutic uh, dosing line and it is, uh, uh, can be ordered through a practitioner only um, or a practitioner recommends it and, and, and prescribes it and then it can be ordered through the website. Um, do you have issues with blood thinning and bruising on two omegas daily? I have not seen it, but you will always find a patient here and a patient there that will have that. But uh, I haven't seen it. You, it certainly is theoretically possible. Um, Ultra-sensitive estradiol, what is the target here? Again, clinical response, but we know that between 50 and 80 picograms per uh, mil, you'll have uh, protection of the bone, brain, and heart, uh, whereas the reproductive range is in the 400, 200 range. So we're not looking for reproductive range. Um, when women get breakthrough bleeding or early periods, is it estrogen or progesterone causing this. Generally, it is um, a combination of too much estrogen and too little progesterone. So you want to elevate the progesterone to get rid of the breakthrough bleeding. But you always will get a, a transvaginal ultrasound to make sure they're not growing anything strange or have a hyperplastic endometrium. Um, so for this evening, that's the number of questions that we're going to take. And I hope that you guys enjoyed this uh, webinar and um, get a chance to um, apply some of this stuff. And thank you very much for being such a great audience.